Many of you have met my big dog, Drake. <laughs> He's part Border Collie, part Australian Shepherd, both of which are guard dogs, and Drake is very good at guarding the house. He guards it from every squirrel that comes into the yard, every leaf that falls anywhere near it, from neighbors that have the audacity to walk by, and especially from that mailman who dares touch the mailbox in the front yard. He hates the mailman. Basically, if it comes near the house, Drake is on it. And you can always tell when he hears something, and he's got great hearing. First, he issues this warning, Boof! And he'll sit there with that great head just kind of cocked and he'll listen. And if he hears that noise again, he is up on his feet. He'll go look out the window, eyes peeled for whatever has made that noise and heaven help you if he sees anything. Because that tail goes up and it gets this rigid kind of a curve in it. He starts to breathe. You can hear him all through the house. And he'll pace from window to window all around the house. And if indeed somebody dare Comes near that house, he goes into full alert, jumping up and down on his two front feet, barking for all he's worth. And he's got this great big bark that seems to come right up from the pit of his stomach. It's absolutely startling, and it will interrupt any thought that you have. <laughs> when I first brought him home, I found myself yelling at him all the time, who's the fool there, duh. And then I finally realized this is simply his nature. And he's bred to herd and to guard. He would be a great cattle dog. Um, but if he's going to live in my house, he need him to act differently. So I started doing some things that would help him. I put up a barrier so he couldn't pace all around the house after he heard something. And, and every time he starts with that, <laughs> I'd call him over and, and pet him um, before he went into full-blown alert. And he is doing better. But helping him learn to go against his instinct takes a lot of time and it takes constant attention. If you've ever had a dog, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, we're not dogs and do not leave here saying the preacher called me a dog, okay? But we are born with a human instinct and a human nature, one that lives very well in this world but one that needs to change if we are going to live in the Father's kingdom. And change is hard. That's why Paul's written some of these same things over and over and over and over and over. Be careful how you handle your words. Be careful how you handle your anger. Be careful how you handle yourself sexually. Put off your old self and put on the new that looks like God. Remember, you are supposed to be. Thank you. I knew you knew that. <laughs> You're probably tired of hearing those things. And this is the last week that we're going to spend in Ephesians. Somebody should say amen. But Ephesians is written to the church to help us learn to live in God's kingdom and to reflect God's character. Last week, we talked about imitating God, no smelly substitutes. And in this last sermon, we're going to look at what it means to be a reflection of that kingdom, the kingdom of light. Now, Paul reminds us first what we have been given in Christ. And you heard that read up there. In verse 14, he gives us this little fragment of an early hymn that was used in the church, most likely at baptism. It says, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from your grave, and Christ will shine on you. Now, there is a lot of scripture and understanding that's packed into those few words that would have been taught as part of instruction leading up to baptism. Let me explain. One of the reasons that we have such a unified theology in the Methodist church is because of the work of Charles Wesley. Charles wrote hymns that taught Methodist theology, and his hymns took scripture and put it together so that we could get a better grasp of a theological concept. For example, in his hymn, O Four Thousand Tongues, to sing, which I would wager a guess you know, the fourth verse speaks of the effect of Jesus' death on our behalf, that it, his death on our behalf has on us. Now, you know this verse. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. I knew you knew that. 
The scripture behind each of those phrases, though, is written throughout the entirety of the New Testament. It's in Romans, it's in Luke, it's in 1 John. But when Wesley puts those things together in that hymn, they give us a beautiful picture of what Jesus' death has done for us. It set us free from captivity for, to sin. It has broken those chains which once bound us. It's broken the power that sin had over us so that we are not dragged back into sin, but rather we can stand against us. And it does not matter what's back there in our past. His blood is able to cleanse us from us, right? And that wonderful gift is offered to each of us individually, to all who will hear and accept it. Thank you, Lord. Does that make sense? Okay. Charles' methodology, taking scripture from all over the Bible to teach a concept, came from the early church. Now, we don't know who wrote this fragment of a hymn, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from, the, from your grave, and Christ will shine on you. But the writer has done the same thing that Wesley did. He's taken verses from all over scripture to give us a theologically sound statement and it's a statement that actually has its roots clear back in prophecy that finds its fulfillment in what Jesus has done. Walk with me through it, if you will. In Isaiah 26, 18, Isaiah laments that Israel has not carried out her purpose because she was supposed to bring God's salvation to the world. But in verse 19, Isaiah writes of a time that that is going to change. And God says through the prophet Isaiah, your dead will live. Your bodies will rise, you who dwell in the dust. Awake and sing for joy. One day, death will no longer have the last word because we will wake up. We know that, right? In John 5, 25, Jesus said, This is the time when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live eternally. That's good news, isn't it? But God, and Paul, uh, Paul adds more to the story in Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5, which you know because we've talked about it here. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive with Christ by grace, you have been saved. So we move from death into life because of God's grace through Jesus Christ, right? Finally, Colossians 1, 12 and 13 tells us what that means in terms of eternity. That God has qualified us through Jesus Christ to share in the inheritance of God's holy people in the kingdom of light. For he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and he's brought us into the kingdom of the son that he loves. That's good news. That is good news. All of that understanding is packed into that little bitty hymn fragment. All of that understanding. Because of Christ, we've awakened from our slumber. We've moved from death to life. Our place of residency has changed from the dominion of darkness, and dominion describes power over something. Turn to your neighbor and say, that power's been broken. Thank you, Lord. And, <laughs> and we have been moved. Our place of residency is now the kingdom of light. We have been given an inheritance there that is incorruptible. It cannot be stolen. It cannot be destroyed, but rather it is waiting there for us at the promise of Jesus Christ. That's an incredible gift. All those things were taught before baptism. The hymn just was meant to bring it back to mind, and it's meant to remind us here in this passage in Ephesians of all that we've been given and all that's at stake for not only us, but for those to whom we will be a witness. So how do we live into that incredible gift that we have been given? Paul answers that in what we read today. He says, live as the light. And he gives us four very practical ways to do that. Again, he says, don't ever forget there is a choice that each person has to make, the choice that you made, or I hope that you made, um, that we'll either live in the kingdom of light or we'll live under the power of darkness. Now, those aren't just Paul's words. Jesus himself describes that same choice in John 3, 19 through 21. He says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world. Who is light? Jesus. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. 
Everyone who, co- who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed, but whoever lives by the truth will come into the light. There's more to that. Um, but that choice of whether to live in the dominion of darkness or the kingdom of light will be based on what we love the most, the things of this world. And they're really familiar because we were born here and they seem perfectly normal. Or the things of God. And Paul makes it very clear that if we want something more than God, and that's what idolatry is, that we won't have those gifts and that inheritance. Jesus says the same thing in Revelation. He says, don't forget your first love. Who's that first love? That's the Sunday school answer. Every one of you knows that. Who's your first love? Jesus. (laughs) But there is a constant choice of our affections that needs to be made, isn't there? That's Paul's first point. Second, he writes, remember what light, which is the life of Christ in us, does. It produces good fruit, Goodness, righteousness, and truth. But now here's the kicker. Light has an inherent quality to it in that it exposes those things which are hidden in the darkness. Sometimes what's hidden in the darkness is that desire to have both the things of the world and the things of God. And sometimes we can't see them because they are so very normal to us. There was some teaching in the church that said it was possible to have both of those things. And Paul calls them immoral and impure and greedy. Immoral refers specifically to sexual immorality. Even as early as the letter to the Ephesians was written, a series of teachings about the human body called the Gnostic teachings were entering the church. And this is what they taught, that the things that you did with the body didn't matter. They were irrelevant to your spiritual life. After all, it's on the inside that it matters. What do you think? (laughs) They attempted to make the teachings of the church about sexuality immaterial. Sound familiar? Others taught that the scriptures themselves were irrelevant, that you could mingle the things of God with the things of the world with no harm. Now, Paul's answer to them is absolutely scathing. Do not let anybody deceive you with such empty-headed nonsense. It's because of that deliberate deception that God's wrath will fall on those who are disobedient. Not only will there be no inheritance, but there will be judgment. And so he says to his church very clearly, do not partner with them. Ow! Because if we partner with those who teach falsely, then we become part of that deliberate deception. And we are without excuse because we know better, don't we? See, we cannot have it both ways. Remember that you are light. And light exposes darkness. It doesn't partner with it. Third, he writes, it is imperative that you find out what pleases the Lord. Now, there's an admonition with that. He says, don't be foolish And I love the Greek language because it's so specific. And what it means is don't be morally stupid. (laughs) It describes someone who will not use their ability to comprehend. Now think about that. What have we been given in order to comprehend? Well, we've been given the word of God, right? We've been given the, um, through the spirit, we've been given 1 Corinthians Corinthians 2 says we have been given the mind of Christ, through the Holy Spirit, right? And we have the guidance of the Holy Spirit who will lead us into all truth. That's his task. But here's the kicker. You have to choose to engage those things. And to you who don't want to look at those things, Paul would say, don't be stupid. You have the potential to understand those things. Look at them and understand what God's pleasing and perfect will is. If we want to know the question of how to live as children of light rather than darkness, we have to look into those things. Lastly, he writes, be careful how you live. Don't live as those who were unwise, but live as those who are wise. You live in an opportune time. Now, opportune there means God's timing. It is not by mistake that you live right here, right now, in this time, and in this place. 
He says that the days that we live in are evil. That means they are lived in a world that is full of darkness. But you, you have an opportunity to influence that and to change it by living as light. Now that's a tremendous responsibility, church, isn't it? To carry it out, we have to live differently. Not as those of this world, even though that's where our nature has lain, but rather as those of the kingdom of light. It takes constant attention because the world calls us and it sounds familiar, doesn't it? But if we are going to live as children of the light, we've got to know how to do that and to understand what God's pleasing and perfect will is. It's found in the word of God. It's found in the mind of Christ. And it's found as we're led by the Holy Spirit. You have access to all of those things through Jesus Christ. What more can we be given? So as we finish this study, and again, some of you are going to say, oh, thank heaven. <laughs> Ephesians has been hard, hasn't it? But as we finish this study, I want to invite us to check our hearts today. I'm going to have four questions here that I want us to consider. One, do you understand what you have been given in Jesus Christ? Do you understand what you've been given in Christ? Second, do you love other things more than you love him? Third, are you willing to seek his ways and his will? And fourth, are you willing to live as light? Let's stop for just a few moments and consider those. I'm going to ask Andrew to play Spirit of the Living God. He's going to play it through a couple of times and then we'll close by singing it. And then I'll close this study in prayer. Do you know what to do?